Appointment with fear. This is your storyteller, the man in black. Here again to bring you another placid evening in our Far Side series, Appointment with Fear. Loss of memory, the eerie darkness which closes down on the brain, is a subject which has often amused me, and that is why I have brought a guest tonight, Dr. Gideon Fell, the celebrated schoolmaster turned detective, to tell you about the Barton case. There sits Dr. Fell himself, all 20 stone of him, with his four chins, his bandit's moustache, his eyeglasses on the broad black ribbon, his face fiery with controversy. And when he tells you about the Barton case, as he told it to me, we trust we shall keep our promise to bring you an appointment with fear. The Clock Strikes Eight by John Dixon Carr, produced by Martin C. Webster. Barton case, sir, was a grim business. I saw the last night of it. I saw what the human soul can endure without quite going mad. And I have no wish to see its like again. For I ask you to imagine yourself in the position of that girl, Helen Barton. Suppose, just suppose, that you wake up suddenly in the middle of the night... You wake up as though from a nightmare, with a feeling you've been asleep a very long time. The room is cold and nearly dark, with the faint glimmer of a fire almost out. Slowly, very slowly, you begin to realize it's a room you've never seen before. That fact, above all, strikes at you through a mist of fear. There's a queer atmosphere, like old stone and disinfectant. And no sound at all in that dim room, except... Uh, uh, What is it? What was that noise? Now, now, lean back in your bed, my dear. It's all right. That's good advice, Miss Barton. You take it easy. I think I must have been dreaming. You were having a nightmare, but it's all right now. Nothing's going to hurt you. Not yet. Be quiet, Anna. No offense, I'm sure, but some people who occupy this room get on my nerves. I I don't want to seem stupid. Uh, I know there must be some explanation, but I don't understand this. Understand what, my dear? Where am I? And how did I get you? And who are you? Now, please, miss, whatever else you do, don't start that all over again. Start what all over again? Telling us you've lost your memory and don't even know what your name is. Are you insane? Of course I know what my name is. I'm Helen Barton. Well, it's a mercy you admit that at last. At last? But uh, I've never spoken to you before in my life. Where am I? Why on earth is it so cold? Well, it's pretty hard to be cozy here in the middle of December. Did you say December? That's right, that's right. The 18th of December. Oh, you're, you're fooling me. You're playing a trick on me. Oh, my head feels queer and I want to cry. I won't. Could, could we have some lights? Of oh. course, straight away. It can't be December, I tell you. That's impossible. It was only yesterday and all the flowers were out. I was going up to see Philip. That's it. I was going up to see Philip. Philip? Who? Philip Gale, the man I was going to marry. It's coming back to me now. It was yesterday and I started up to see Philip. Oh, for heaven's sake, miss. Be quiet, Hannah. 
And don't turn her those lights yet. Oh, she's having us on, Hannah. This girl's shaking all over, and she doesn't know where she is. <laughs> now, miss, now listen to me. I'm going to sit down on the bed beside you. <laughs> now, now just take my hands and hold them tight. What's wrong? Why are you looking at me like that? I've got something to tell you. Is it about Philip? It is about him, yes, in a way. I want you to keep tight hold of my hands. You see, Miss Barton, this is Madehurst Prison. <laughs> steady now, steady. I'm steady. still dreaming. I must be. It was the end of August, and I, I started up to see Philip. You can't mean I'm in prison. Now listen, my dear. I'm afraid it's worse than that. Worse than that? Look over there. You see where there's a little bit of fire in the grate? Well? And paper on the wall and, and pictures and a carpet on the floor. Why can't you come out straight and tell her? They're going to hang you in the morning, Miss Barton. This is the condemned cell. No! With sudden shock, the prison clock smote on the shivering air. But I won't quote that any further. I have too vivid a memory of sitting up that night with Colonel Andrews, the governor of the prison. It was in a little office with the lampshade tilted so that I could see his face. And he said, I hate executions, loathe them. Can't sleep the night before. If you hadn't offered to come here and save my life, I... This is a strange time, sir, to talk of saving lives. It's no good being sentimental about the thing. That's the law. I didn't make it. But I gather you're not exactly happy about this case. I'm not, and that's a fact. Mind you, there's no doubt whatever about the girl's guilt. Hmm. I am gratified to hear it. But if only she'd confess. Most of them do, you know. They confess to you? To me or to the hangman. Sometimes I wish I had any job in the world but mine. If only the girl would confess. If only she'd just stop this nonsense about not remembering. Not remembering what? Not remembering how she shot Philip Gale. Not remembering anything, even her own name. Total amnesia, covering a crime. Do you mean to say that a woman suffering from loss of memory can be tried and sentenced to death? No. Not if she really has lost her memory. But this amnesia defense was a fake. You're quite sure of that? Oh, naturally. A judge would never have allowed it to come to trial if he hadn't been convinced she was shamming. Even then, she might have got off with a life sentence or even with manslaughter if it hadn't been for the nature of the crime. She didn't cut anybody up, I hope. No, no, no. It was almost as bad. She shot a man who raised his hands and begged for mercy. That completely damned her in the eyes of the jury. And yet... You have doubts. Tell you I haven't any doubts. And in any case, it's it, it, none of my business. How has she acted since she's been here? Oh, a model prisoner. Ah, but I wish she'd stop this business of seeming to be in a daze. It's, it's getting on my nerves. Nice girl, too. I knew her grandfather. She lived near here? Yes. Born and bred in Maidhurst. She got mixed up with a thoroughgoing swine named Philip Gale. Mad about him. Wouldn't hear a word against him. Then he, he threw her over for a woman with money. I see. Yeah. He had a bungalow on White Rose Hill. She went up there one Sunday afternoon. Alone? Yes. Herbert Gale, Philip's brother, heard them screaming at each other. He ran in to see what was wrong. Philip was trying to chase the girl up. She grabbed a thirty-two revolver out of a table drawer and told Philip to put up his hands. Huh. Yes, well, that scared him. He did put up his hands. Then she shot him dead and went down in a fit. And afterwards? Afterwards, she couldn't remember. Couldn't remember anything? Pretended she didn't even recognize her own family. She said, who is Philip Gale? And you hang her tomorrow morning. Yes. 
without even hearing her side of the case. Confounded man, there's, there's no doubt about the evidence. Are you sure? She killed Philip Gale. Gale's brother, Herbert, saw her do it. This hypocrisy about, about not remembering... Emotional shock could do just that, you know. She wasn't so emotionally shocked that it disturbed her ape. She drilled him clean through the heart at 15 feet. The bullet entered in a dead straight line through coat, waistcoat, shirt, and heart. <laughs> you could have run a pencil through the holes. Now, now, don't sit there puffing out your cheeks and waving a cigar at me. I'm, I'm only trying... Tell me, Colonel Andrews, aren't you talking to convince yourself? No. Suppose that the girl is telling the truth. Suppose she has lost her memory. I tell you... All right, you don't believe that. But suppose it. And then suppose in some black hour just before the hangman comes that her memory returns. Ugh, don't talk rubbish. Sir, I have lived long enough to know that mental suffering is the cruelest form of suffering on this earth. Imagine yourself in that position. You come out of a daze into what you thought was a safe and pleasant world. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's happened. You only know that when the clock strikes eight, they are going to take you out and hang... No! Did you hear that? Yes. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yes. It isn't possible. I very much fear it is. Sometimes, you know, we... We have to use drugs. Drugs? Yes. When we take them to the execution shed... It's only a short distance, and we try to get it over in a matter of seconds, but sometimes they they can't walk. Yes, yes, what is it? I beg pardon, sir, but I thought I'd better get you, or the doctor, or, or the chaplain, or both. What's the matter with you, man? You're white as a ghost. Can't help that, sir. I've been a warder in this place for a matter of 15 years, but I never knew anything like this. It's the upstairs room, I suppose, Miss, uh, Miss Barton. Yes, sir. Hysterical? Uh, yes, sir. She says, well, she says she remembers now. I see. She's carrying on something awful, sir. That ain't all. She she claims she never done it. What's sir. that? She claims she never killed Mr. Gale at all. Never killed? That's all, Harris. You can go. Uh, yes, sir. Any other disturbances in the building? Well, sir, they're a bit restless in uh, wing A. Ah, well, that's, uh, that's usual. Uh, yes, sir. And there's a bloke... Outside the prison, I mean, who keeps hanging about in front of the main gate. You can see him by the street lamp. First he'll take a few little quick steps back and forth, and then he'll run and stick his face against the bars of the gate. And uh, then he'll go back to the pacing again. Fair gave me the creeps even before this other thing. You don't happen to know who it is? It's the other Mr. Gale, sir. Uh -huh. Herbert Gale. I, I hadn't the heart to chase him away. All right, Harris, all right, all right. Go ahead, I'll, um, I'll be along in a minute. Uh, yes, sir. So the girl claims to be innocent. You heard that? Yes, I heard it. What do you mean to do? Well, I'll, I'll see her, of course. But it won't affect the issue. Not even if she does happen to be innocent? Well, in the name of heaven, try to understand my position. I'm dreading this interview. It's against regulations, but I... I wish you'd come along with me. If there were only something... Well, there isn't. Now, where's that whiskey? I... I think a little stimulant. She will need the stimulant. Well, it's, a, it's a cold night. It will be colder yet where she's going. But I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't. Quiet, Do it. Miss, quiet. It's all right, my dear. It's all right. The governor and the other gentlemen, they believe you did. Oh, no, they it. don't. You needn't try to fool me. Look at them over there in the corner whispering. Fell, she's lying. I heard that. You said, Fell, she's lying. But I'm not lying. I'm not. Miss Barton, you've got to pull yourself together. Please listen to me. When I first woke up, I didn't even remember Philip was dead. Then it came back to me. Yes? I remember standing outside Philip's bungalow on a hot day with the sun in my eyes. I heard a shot inside the bungalow. I ran into the living room and found Philip lying on the floor by the couch with his mouth open and blood on his chest. That's all I do remember. Something hit me. Something hit you? On the head, or oh, that's what it seemed like. 
please. The doctor's found no injury to your head, you know. I tell you... One I... moment. Miss Barton, can you forgive the intrusion of an old buffer who sincerely wants to help you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Bell. I'll try to be sensible. Now tell me, when you arrived at the bungalow, Philip Gale was already dead? Yes. You didn't go up there to quarrel with him? No. And why should I have killed him anyway? I only went to tell him I was through, finished, fed up with him. I... Oh, what's the use? They haven't told you then that there's a witness who claims to have seen you shoot Gale? A witness? Who? Herbert Gale. But... But that's a lie. You didn't take a thirty-two revolver out of the table drawer? Oh, this is the first time I've even heard of any revolver. Please believe that. You didn't order Philip to put up his hands, and then when he did put up his hands... High above his head? You didn't shoot him from a distance of about 15 feet? No, no, no. Your fingerprints were on the revolver. You were still holding it in your hand when Herbert brought a policeman. <laughs> it looks as though you've got me, doesn't it? I'm afraid it does. <laughs> Just... Who is this brother, this Herbert Gale? <laughs> He's the good member of the family. Now then, my dear, now then. I steady, can't help steady, it. Steady, steady. <laughs> Herbert is the good boy, where Philip was the bad one. Younger than Philip, horribly respectable. Pillar of the church, never smokes or drinks. Has to work hard because Philip inherited what money they had. <laughs> oh, let me laugh. You don't know how funny it is. Herbert's word certainly carries weight. It's carried weight against me, hasn't it? Why should he want to get me hanged? Why should he tell such a complete bag of lies? Yes, I wonder why. Every second I imagine I'm going to wake up and find myself back in that living room again, looking at Philip's body, just standing and staring at it and feeling sick. And... Of all things to think of at a time like that. Wondering why he was wearing a waistcoat on such a hot day. Hmm. Arkans of Athens, what an idiot I've been. What a turnip, what a thundering dance. Do your voice. The murdered man was wearing a waistcoat. You told me so yourself. Well, what if I did? The murdered man was wearing a waistcoat on a hot day. Grasp that beautiful fact, my friend. Keep it in splendor before you. Three hours of sheer nightmare, and all because I never thought of the waistcoat. Let me ask you just one thing. What happened to the court exhibits in the Gale case? Oh, as a matter of fact, we've, um, we've still got them. The case was tried and made Hearst decisive. You've still got them? Certainly, but what good can they do now? Sir, let me shake your hand. Let me slap you on the back. Let just me... Just a minute, my friend. Stop a bit. Quiet. I, I beg your pardon. Have you, have you forgotten where we are? No. Let's face facts. The prisoner has been told that there's, well, no hope. Please. I'm sorry, please, but there it is. Please, you can't. The cruelest thing you could do now would be to raise hopes that I can't fulfill. You understand that? I understand it only too well. This can't be pleasant for any of us. There's nothing in the evidence that justifies any change of plan. Except, of course, that the girl isn't guilty. Can you prove that? To my own satisfaction, yes. I'm afraid that's not good enough. Suppose I proved it to you, conclusively, mind. Out of evidence you gave me yourself, what would you do? Are you bluffing? No, speak up, man. What would you do? Well, that's easy. Phone the Home Secretary and ask for a stay of execution. There's a private line from my office to his country house. But I warn you... Dr. Fell, is there any hope for me? Is there any hope for I me? warn you, Fell, they won't accept fancy theories. They'll only accept facts. Tell me, Miss Barton, how tall is the estimable Mr. Herbert Gale? Uh, how tall? Yes. Is he anything like the same height as his brother, Philip? Well, they're about the same height, five feet ten, but I don't see... If I remember correctly... One of the warders told us that Herbert Gale has been hanging about the front gate all night. I should very much like to speak with him. Colonel Andrews, will you send someone out and ask him to come into your office? I can't do that. Why not? It's against regulations. You have to get a special pass. Stay and write to him. Curse it all. Can't you get it through your correct military head that an innocent person is going to swing in less than two hours? Dr. Bell, I don't know what you're trying to do, but can you do it? I... <sighs> Dear, I can't but tell. But you are going to try. I'm going downstairs now. Maybe in a very short time, 
A certain gentleman will be entering this institution without any need of a pass. But don't hope for anything, my dear. Don't hope for anything. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Less than an hour to go. Oh, why doesn't that warder come and bring the exhibit I want? What's delaying him? Probably he, he can't find the stuff. But you said you had it here. Things like that I have to get mislaid. It's been a month since the trial. Must you must you have these exhibits? In order to prove it to you fully, yes. But if he doesn't come in two seconds more... I can't stay here much longer myself. The chaplain's with our now, but I shall have to take over before the end. Yes, yes, come in. Sorry to have been so long, sir. I could have sworn it was in one place, and lo and behold, it turns up somewhere else. Never mind that. Did you get the exhibits? It's all here, sir, in this suitcase. Where shall I put it? Put it on Colonel Andrews' desk. Ah, now let's see. Move the lamp over here, will you? Uh, and about Mr. Herbert Gale, sir. Where is he? Out in the hall, sir. Do you want to see him now? Yes, yes, my lad. Very much so. Ask him to come in. You can come in, sir. This way. Thank you. Ah, morning, Herbert. I'm glad to see you. Sit down. Thank you, Colonel Andrews. Let me have your hat and coat. This, um, this is Dr. Gideon Phil. Uh, uh, how do you do? Uh, the warder said you wanted to see me. I came, of course, but do you think it was quite the right thing to do? Well, why not? Well, people might think I was holding a grudge against Helen. Because of Phil, you know. And you don't hold any grudge? No. I pity that poor girl from the bottom of my heart. I only wish I hadn't had to testify against her. But what else could I do? You mean you'd like to help her even now? Of course I would. If there's anything I can do to, to soothe her last moment... There is something you can do, Mr. Gale. Well? You can come with us to the condemned cell. Are you joking? No. Wouldn't it be horrible for Helen? Yes, probably. But as you point out, she has only a very short time to live. Yes. Excuse me, but uh, what have you got in that suitcase? In uh, this suitcase, Mr. Gale? A flattened bullet. The bullet that killed your brother. A thirty-two revolver. A tweed coat bloodstained. A tweed waistcoat. Also bloodstained. Chiafel, what do you expect to prove with that stuff? Will Mr. Herbert Gale go with us to the condemned cell? Of course, if you think I can do any good there. Then, with your permission, I propose to prove that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. <laughs> Will you walk into my parlor? <laughs> Thirty. Half an hour to go. Easy, my dear. Easy. Easy. They're not coming already to... Herbert Gale. I'm very sorry for you, Helen. Please believe that. Thank you. I shouldn't have intruded at this painful time. Believe me, Helen. But Dr. Fell and the Colonel here made me come to see you. You mean you've come to confess? Confess? What should I confess? You didn't see me shoot Phil. You know you didn't. I'm sorry, Helen. I pity you and I bear you no malice even now. But you did shoot poor old Phil. You shot him in cold blood after you'd asked him to put up his hands. How high did he put up his hands? I, I beg your pardon? I said, how high did he put up his hands? Look here, you're only upsetting poor Helen. Is there any purpose in going over all this in the last few minutes before... Before the hangman... Oh, please, please! We might even illustrate what happened with a little experiment. I have here in this suitcase a blood-stained tweed coat and a blood-stained waistcoat. You see them, Mr. Gale? I see them, yes. 
I should like you to take off your own coat and waistcoat. I should then like you to put on this coat and this waistcoat. I'll do no such thing. Why not? Haven't you tortured poor Helen enough? Colonel Andrews, I appeal to you. I, I, I don't see what the game is, but where's the harmony? Helen's feelings. Never mind my feelings, Herbert. And I've only got a few minutes left. Put on the coat and waistcoat. You hear a condemned person's last request, Mr. Gale. Will you do it? Yes, if you insist. I still don't see what this is all about. If something isn't done very soon... Colonel Andrews, sir? Yes, Harris? I thought I'd better tell you, sir, that the chaplain's here and the witnesses are ready and the, and the other person, too. You mean the hangman, don't you? Easy, you mean the... Dear, easy, easy. He's got to come and bind her hands, sir. It's five minutes to eight. Sorry, Phil, but this has got to stop. I must ask you to clear out of here immediately while we... For God's sake, man, wait. I can prove it now. You can prove what? I can prove Mr. Herbert Gale lied when he sentenced this girl to death. You must be out of your mind. You can't do any such thing. Oh, yes, I can. Do you notice, all of you, that he's wearing the dead man's coat and waistcoat? All right. Suppose I am. What about it? You will imagine, Mr. Gale, with this powerful imagination of yours, that I am threatening you with a revolver. Now hold up your hands. What the devil are you gabbling Hold about? up your hands, sir. High above your head. I won't do it. You'd better do it, Herbert. You'd better do it. You as a gentleman. I'm asking you now. That's it, Mr. Gale. Don't let your hands tremble when you raise them. Just lift your hands higher, higher still, while I'm threatening you with a revolver. Now look at this coat, everybody. Look at the coat. I refuse to Don't lower your hands, Mr. Gale. And the rest of you, look at his coat. That coat, it rises when he lifts his hand. But of course it does. And the bullet hole in the coat, you notice, rises with it. But the waistcoat is buttoned close to the body. The waistcoat doesn't move. I think I begin to see. The bullet hole in the coat has risen at least four inches above the corresponding hole in the waistcoat. Yet, the bullet you told me penetrated in a dead straight line through coat, waistcoat, and shirt. Therefore, Philip Gale could not possibly have had his hands raised when he was shot. It's a damned lie! It was a damned lie, sir. <laughs> you killed Philip Gale yourself. When Helen Barton walked into the middle of your crime, you knocked her out with a weapon that left no bruise and put the revolver into her hand. Then you discovered, as a gift from heaven, that she had lost her memory. You could tell any lying story you liked. But it's upset the apple cart now. The prosecution, the evidence, the verdict were all based on the evidence of the shooting of a man who had his hands raised. Destroy that single lie, and you create the reasonable doubt that destroys the whole case. This is true, Colonel Andrews. Is it true? Can't you at least say something? Harris. Yes, sir? Do you know the private telephone line in my office? Yes, sir. Get me the home secretary. so, with the end of the story, the clock strikes eight. We come to the end of our present group of stories in the series, Appointment with Fear. If you have been pleased, if you have been entertained, if you have been able to say that only the graveyards have yawned, then we are deeply grateful. Indeed. With the slightest encouragement, I, who am amused by such things, should return to tell you more tales of corpses and the midnight hour. But until that happy day when we meet again by some evil crossroad of the future, this is your storyteller, the man in black, saying good night and goodbye. You 
have just heard the clock strikes eight, the last play in the series, Appointment with Fear, written by John Dixon Carr and produced by Martin C. Webster. Those taking part were Richard George as Dr. Fell, Griselda Harvey as Helen Barton, Richard Williams as Colonel Andrews, Basil Jones as Herbert Gale, Frank Cochrane as Harris, Gladys Spencer as a wardress, Anne Codrington as the second wardress, and Valentine Dial as the storyteller.